Welcome to the Good Quality Podcast brought to you by Swish Cultures with your host, Ashton Smith Gooden, shining light onto women in sports and entertainment. Our first guest ever on the pod, making history by being the first NCAA women's head coach to be hired by an NBA team, first female coach in Cavs history, and many more accolades attached to her name. Let's welcome Cleveland Cavaliers assistant coach, Lindsay Gottlieb. How are you doing, Lindsay? I'm doing great. I'm honored to be your first guest. I know when you go big time with this whole thing, you'll have to remember me when you have, you know, when you have all kinds of guests on, you can remember that I was first. (laughs) Oh, stop. You're already, you know, you're the pioneer. (laughs) So I'm just so excited to have you on board. And I I really appreciate you for for coming and talking with me today. So I kind of, (laughs) thank you. Uh, So I kind of wanted to start it off a little bit about your transition from women's college basketball into the NBA space, because you kind of have to go through, you know, two different sectors, right? Like transitioning from women's sports to men's, as well as from college to professional. So how was that transition? Yeah, I mean, I would even add to that being a head coach, you know, which I've been for 11 years to go back to be an assistant. So there's been a whole lot of change this year. Um, And I think I'd be lying if I said that it was all easy or all completely smooth. Um, but I don't think that was the intent, right? At the end of the day, when I was, I was really happy at Cal as the women's basketball coach, I was fulfilled. But when this opportunity came along with the Cavs, um, I think what it came down to for me, and, and it was actually my husband who said, like, what do you want your legacy to be? And this opportunity to go to the NBA, to be one of the first, but really just to have this incredible kind of life experience in the space of basketball, which is what I love, I felt like I had to do it. And I knew with having to do it would come some hard things, some uncomfortable at times. But I will say the discomfort was never really coaching men. Like that's been pretty seamless. It's just having done one thing for 20 years, coaching women's college basketball was my wheelhouse. I I could tell you, you know, the rhythms of the season and and how you, you know, mix things up with your players and kind of what to expect. And then going to the NBA, it was a little bit different, um, of an environment. And that's been a great challenge for me to have to figure it all out. But overall, uh, the men on the team have been incredibly receptive and the the coaching staff, everyone in the building. Um, And I think the things that elite athletes value the most in their coaches transcend gender. So that's why I think at the end of the day, it hasn't been uh, too difficult. (laughs) Right. Were there anyone um, that were able to help you along the process, like any other professional coaches? especially like in the women's field, because I know uh, Becky Hammond, as well as um, the NBA assistant coach for the San Antonio Spurs, you know, she was also one of the first to to be in this field. So was she able to help you or was she able to mentor anything that you've learned? Yeah, she was one of the first people to reach out uh, when I, you know, when it was public that I took the job. And, And I think that the women in the NBA do have sort of a network uh, when we were at Summer League in July, they did like a get yeah. together for all the women working in the NBA, whether it's in the front office or the league office or coaching on a team. So, um, you know, it's it's always nice to be able to lean on people who are having a shared experience. Uh, no question, Becky's been great and Jenny Busek and Kara Lawson. Um, but I think the people that really have sort of been there for me have been the, the people on my own staff. So J.B. Right. Vickerstaff is now our head coach. You know, he began the year yeah. as the associate head coach. He was like my he was my go-to, you know, all year simply because it's funny, his career trajectory was actually very similar to mine in terms of timing. Like he went and pretty much became a coach right after college. He just went to the NBA and I was in women's college basketball, but we're similar in age and kind of similar in career path. And so he was a great person for me to bounce things off of and say, Hey, you know, what do you think about this? Or how would you approach that? And, and so that, that actually, um, I think was the person on a day-to-day basis that sort of helped me transition the most. Right. No, that definitely, that definitely makes sense. And so going on to about your coaching career, because you mentioned that in the past, I kind of want to start it off a little bit with the beginning of how you got into coaching in the first place, because I read that you went to Brown University, which is an amazing college, first and foremost, to go to. But can you expand a little bit on your experience at Brown? Sure. Um, Yeah, I loved Brown. It was a wonderful uh, school, still obviously, you know, appreciative of everything I I learned in the classroom and the experiences I had outside the classroom. But but here's the thing, and and this is, it's interesting, I've thought a lot about this recently. My college career didn't go according to to script. I tore my ACL my senior year of high school. Um, 
which, you know, is a, is a big injury in women's college basketball and probably even bigger, you know, whenever that was 25 years ago, it takes a little longer, you know, took a little longer to get back then. So I wanted to play basketball. I worked my way back, but I spent much of, you know, my college career on the bench um, in a different role. And what I think I really learned in college, well, first of all, I was an X's and O's nerd. Like I really loved basketball and I loved film. And so, you know, in college, I really embraced this idea of like, wow, this is a profession. You know, you can, you can coach for a living, but probably what pushed me into coaching even more than just the love of X's and O's was this idea that I had so many friends in college athletics at the same time as me, whether it was my you know friends on other teams at Brown or my friends playing women's college basketball across the country and some people had great experiences and some people had terrible experiences. And, yeah. and I would say that most people's experiences were determined by how they felt about their coach or how they felt about their team. It was, no one was calling me saying, oh, my chemistry class is a little bit too big or too small, right? Like they were right. saying, you know, I love my coach or, or, or my coach makes me feel terrible, yeah. whatever, whatever it is. So yeah. at that moment, when I was in college, I really, I think, you know, was drawn to this idea that as a college basketball coach, you could do basketball for a living, but you could also have this incredible impact on 18 to 22 year olds at a very pivotal point in their life. And so that's what I decided I wanted to that's do. important. Yeah, and my senior year of college, you know, like you at, at Cal, I was around a lot of um, very goal-oriented people at Brown and everyone else I was like applying for jobs already. And I was like, well, I wanna coach, what can I do to help myself? And so I wrote a letter to every division one head coach in women's basketball and said, Hey, I'm graduating from college in the spring. I want to get into coaching. And funny enough, a lot of them wrote me back. Uh, um, even <laughs> if we don't have a job, uh, but it was cool to get some letters back. And I ultimately got a job at Syracuse, um, which I, I, you know, was hired the day after I graduated from college and been coaching ever since I was 21 years old. That, that's amazing. I really think that's very pivotal. One, that you played the sport, so you're able to relate to the athletes that you're coaching. And I also read up that um, you came, you actually went to Australia, am I right? During I did. your sophomore year? Um, My junior because, year, yeah. Oh, your junior year. Um, yeah. And then once you came back, you were a player as well as a, as a player's uh, an assistant, right? Yes. Your team? So, yes. So in the Ivy league, you know, there's a little more flexibility because you're not technically <laughs> on scholarship. And so, um, I did, I did go abroad, uh, my junior year. I just felt like I needed a life experience, but I was so connected to basketball that before I, I went abroad, I said to my coach, like, I really, you know, want to be a part of the team when I come back. And she was great. She said, you know, you've earned that. Um, and when I came back, that's when I knew I wanted to go into coaching. So I wasn't done playing. Like I, I loved being part of the team. I loved practicing hard. And so she allowed me to be a student assistant coach while I was playing. Right. So it was pretty unique. Like I would go through practices, but then I would also work in the office on recruiting and I would kind of, you know, be in coaches meetings when they would be talking about certain things. I think they trusted me to be able to handle that. Um, yeah. And it was a great experience for me. Um, a little bit different, you know, than your average senior year of college, but I think it, it kind of kickstarted my, my desire to really get into the game full time when I graduated. No, for sure. Um, a lot of the times when I would see you coach during the games at Cal, it seems like every time a player came off the court, they would give you a hug or they'll like, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? It was very personable. So do you think that has allowed you to build that connection with the players that you're coaching that give you a little more of like a, an understanding of what each player needs because you were able to uh, be a player as well as a coach at such a young age? I think so. I mean, I, I, one of my sort of philosophies in coaching is that you need to be authentic to who you are. And for me, um, kind of meeting players where they are, being relational, caring about their stories, knowing what's going on with them, that's all part of who I think am I, who I am as a person and then part of who I am as a coach. Again, that doesn't mean you don't push people, right? You have to be mm -hmm. able to, you know, get them to a higher level than what they thought. But, but for me, kind of, caring about the whole person is just sort of the only way I know how to do it. Um, at Cal, it definitely became, you know, a lot more hugs, a yeah. lot more kind of just that intimate sort of, you know, but that's what team is, right? Like there's a lot of high fives and sort of, you know, like touching closeness. And it's interesting, like with this pandemic going on, I think it'd be interesting to see, like, I hope that part doesn't change. Like I know 
Um, you know, I know our players, you know, the Cavs miss that. It's not, that's not a female thing. That's not a college thing. That's a, that's a team thing where you want exactly. to connect, you know, high five and be close. So I think that's just what part of my coaching style because it's part of, you know, being, being authentic. Um, I don't know if that comes from having been, you know, a player coach, but more just developing my, my style over the years and trying to figure out what players need. And I think across the board, one shared desire is for, for kids and young people to feel their, their coach as a person. And that makes them more willing to, to play hard. Got you. Definitely. I definitely agree with that. Um, when you transition into the NBA space, what do you feel is the, was the biggest asset that you were able to bring to the Cavs franchise? That's a good question. Um, I do feel one of the reasons I took the job is that the GM Kobe Altman was not, it was very clear that this wasn't like a token thing. It wasn't like, okay, I guess we want a female on the staff. Yeah. And he was very specific about, you know, who I was as a person, what I had done and, and the development piece of, of our organization. Right. I mean, I think it was pretty clear, like, Hey, you know, Le LeBron won a championship here, but I don't think he's coming back. So we have to figure <laughs> out another way to be good. And that way yeah. is going to be, you know, developing the young players that we have and creating an environment that free agents want to come to. And I think that, you know, Kobe thought I could contribute to that positive environment. So I don't necessarily think it's any one thing. I think it's, you know, 20 years of having coached college, you know, we have a young, a lot of young players and development is big for us. But I also think I don't, I don't shy away from, characteristics that are part of me that are maybe uniquely female, right? I don't think all women have certain characteristics mm -hmm. and all men have certain, but I do think like, I'm not afraid to bring my unique perspective, which comes from women's college basketball. It comes from my own experiences as, as a female. So I just try to bring my whole self to the job and, um, you know, I do a bunch of player development, you know, but involved in, in film and, you know, figuring out, helping to figure out what offense or defense might be best for us to run and getting the guys to buy into what it is that we're trying to do, kind of like what anyone else would do yeah. as an assistant coach. And then I do feel like having been a head coach, I do try to bring just sort of some leadership to the staff of like, hey, this is what our head coach needs from us as assistants, right. because I have that perspective a little bit. Yeah, I think that's a good point that you that you mentioned, especially with bringing that perspective to the head coach and like, how you're saying this is what maybe need to be implemented within the team and just all that, um, all that information. And I meant, uh, I remember that you mentioned earlier the transition from a head coach to an assistant coach, right? So what yeah. type of perspective and type of information um, do you translate over to the team and to the whole coaching staff from bringing that head coaching uh, ideology into the assistant position? Yeah, for sure. I would say, so in the NBA, we, we, because there's a pretty big staff, we each have players that we work with individually. There's a lot of games and not that much practice. So your, your kind of short windows with players on game day become really important. Like we do 15 minutes of shots and, you know, 15 minutes of film, like before the game. So, you know, I have um, a couple players that I'm doing that with, uh, Colin Sexton, Alfonso McKinney. So I think what I try and do, you know, it's, it's cool, you know, being back as an assistant coach, being able to have that individual time with players, right. but yeah. I try and bring the perspective of knowing like, this is what our game plan is today. This is how the other team's going to play us. These, these are the big picture concepts, you know, that we've come up with as a staff and let me, you know, help Colin in his small kind of window of what his role is, do his part. Right. So I think the ability to kind of toggle between the concepts that we're working on as a team and then relating that to individual players. I, I feel like that messaging is something I was able to kind of practice and hone for 11 years as a head coach. But mainly I think also on the staff, I, I understand how much the head coach has on, on their plate. Right. So having done that for a while and what I always, you know, the head coach has to, to worry about the whole team and, you know, where the, where the, the team is, you know, as a group. And certainly I, I, I would never want, that leader to have to worry about like me as a staff member or any other staff members like we got to have right. our our stuff together so they can worry about you know everything else and I think that perspective comes from having been a head coach and knowing like hey I got to keep my eyes on the big picture thing so you guys handle everything else so I guess yeah. I'm trying to do the handling of everything else to help him out to the best ability that I that I can no for sure that definitely I, I definitely agree with that because you know that's a lot that's a lot of pressure that everyone not just the head coach but everyone uh within the program has to deal with and you made a great point with that and going on with you know 
definitely the pressures and all of the different stuff that comes along within um, the franchise. How have you seen it change with the coronavirus and COVID, yeah. like with COVID? How are you guys able to kind of handle not only making sure that the players are good, but like the mental space that all the players are going through right now? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a struggle for everyone. And, and, you know, when I say that, we obviously recognize, you know, relative to people who have lost lives or loved ones or people who are fighting this every day on the front lines, being a, you know, working in a grocery store or working in a hospital. Like we know that we're in a place of privilege, right? Like being in the NBA. That being said, like we have lost something. And I think you have to acknowledge how hard it is for people who have spent their entire adult lives as part of a team. This is the longest any of us have been without a team, you know, seeing them every single day. So it's hard. Um, so we also felt like we had really good momentum after all-star break, you know, coach right. JB took over after all-star break and, and we felt like we were making some really positive strides. And so the things that we've tried to do for the most part are keep the chemistry momentum that we felt like we were building as alive and well as possible. So, um, you know, just staying connected with the guys, keeping them feeling like we're a unit providing whatever they need, whether that's just checking in on them or, yeah. um, you know, it's been helpful, that we've been, you know, the guys have been who are here have been allowed back into the facility for a couple of weeks now just to really to see people and get some shots up. And then as a staff, we've been meeting twice a week and just doing everything from kind of actually working on some X's and O's, like projects that will help us get better, but also just staying connected as a unit and talking mm. about kind of where we want to go. So we're doing the best that we can, but nothing's the same as being together, uh, but we're doing the best that we can to, to provide resources for the players and also to stay as connected as possible. No, definitely. So with that being said, how do you feel about um, going to the, the ability to play at Walt Disney in Orlando? Like what, what is your thoughts about, about that? About I mean, continuing season? yeah, I think everybody's looking forward to getting the NBA back first and foremost, but you know, when it's safe and when it's appropriate. And that's where the leadership of Adam Silver is pretty unbelievable. Cause I think, there's a lot of cohesiveness in the league and there's a lot of trust in the league from the, from the players and the GMs and the owners, like people believe in Adam Silver. So there's no perfect solution, but I think when you're behind the leader, people are going to buy into what he and the league decides and understand that it's for the good of, you know, health and safety first and the good of the league. Now, that being said, I'm like, <laughs> I hope, I really hope we get to go, you know, there's yeah. the different scenarios out there that have some have only the playoff teams, some have playoff plus, um, you know, obviously we would be in a, uh, the bigger group that could potentially be left out. And the reason that we as a staff really want to go is that we have a lot, lot of young guys and development's really important to us. So we For want sure. the opportunity to keep playing together, whether that's a, you know, two weeks of practice and a couple games, that's better than nothing. Um, so we're hopeful, uh, like we want to go um, and kind of finish out 2021 and then feel good about starting the next season whenever it starts. That being said, if the decision for the league is otherwise, um, obviously I'll be supportive and just trying to, you know, be a fan and watch um, watch at Disney from afar. But it would be cool to be in it, and it would be cool to be part of this. A, you know, just just something that we've never experienced in our lifetime. So uh, if there's a little NBA bubble in in uh, Orlando, we we hope the Cavs are there. Right. No, I definitely hope you guys are there too. Uh, we were very curious about how that was going to work out, but it seems like they're getting it. You know, there's a lot of progress with that. And um, so is there any, any updates with it that, that recently have occurred or? From the last things I've heard, uh, I know a survey went out to all the GMs, you know, as expected, there isn't total consensus just because I think yeah. each team has a little bit different perspective on what would be best. But I think the league is gathering information. Uh, it looks like they're, they're kind of honing in on some scenarios that would make sense and then figuring out what they can get accomplished, um, you know. Everything I've heard says there's going to be testing every day uh, for the people who are there. Um, you know, they want they want to crown a champion this year, but they want it to feel legitimate. So okay. they're, they're open yeah. to new creative ideas, but it's going to be, you know, seven game series and it's going to be, you know, feel um, as real as possible because everybody knows that, you know, it has to be done at a high level because this is the NBA and that's what people expect. Right. With your personal opinion, how, how much time do you think the players need in order to be ready to go back into, like, the, the season? I mean, from what I, I've heard that they feel like is, like, two weeks in a group setting. 
okay. uh, like a two week ramp up. So I do think, you know, most guys are on their own staying as in shape as possible. That may not involve, you know, a, a basketball per se, and it's certainly not involving team drills. Um, but I think once you get everyone together, you know, training camp in, in the NBA is, is less than two weeks. So I think um, if, if everyone's in decent shape, I, from what I've heard that the guys prefer, you know, two, maybe three weeks of a ramp up and then, and then start playing. And it's, I think mm-hmm. there's a couple different options. Like some people are, they're talking about where the ramp up, you know, and the, the training camp style thing happens in individual markets. And then you go to Orlando, or mm-hmm. I've heard there's talk of send everyone to Orlando, have a two week, you know, ramp up time, practice time, and then start playing. So I think it could be either way. I mean, there's some idea that, you know, maybe testing and safety could be better monitored in one spot, or, you know, you let people kind of come back to their own markets, do it on their own, and then come. I've heard both ways. So we'll see. There's a lot to still be done, but I know the NBA league office is really working hard on it. Okay. Yeah, for sure. That definitely makes a lot of sense. I like the fact that they have a lot of different options in place, you know, to consider definitely to consider um, more than one factor when it comes right. to this because it's it's something that no one has dealt with having sports canceled in general and trying to reboot it back up and try to make it as normal as possible for not only the players but the coaches the fans everyone involved with it is a very difficult situation and I agree with you I think Silver is doing a great job with trying to bring everyone together and trying to figure this out appropriately I definitely agree yeah. with that there's no playbook for any of this. That's for sure. <laughs> Absolutely no playbook. I agree. Uh-huh. <laughs> kind of uh, turning the conversation a little bit. I want to talk about, um, or actually get your views about, um, you know, within women's sports, we see a lot of men coaches within volleyball, within basketball, soccer, you see predominantly men. So do you think that that change is going to happen within men's sports more? Do you think it's going to be more frequent to see a lot of women come into that space and take um, top roles such as head coaches, assistant coaches, and so forth? I mean, I definitely think we're trending towards it being more acceptable and and more of a a true option for for, men's sports to have women in positions of power. The thing that has stood out the most to me after this year in the NBA is that I'm like having spent this year, I'm, I'm actually more surprised that there are not more women in men's college basketball. And, and the reason I say that is, you know, there's a lot of men who are assistant coaches in women's college basketball. And, you know, some people have different beliefs on, you know, whether women should only hire women or, or whatnot. My belief was always, I wanted to find the best staff for my team, right? Like, was yeah. I meeting the needs of my players? And that was by individual people that was with different backgrounds, you know, and most of the time that involved a male on staff. I think of my eight years at Cal, I think six years I had a male on staff Two I didn't in it. Those I felt like were the best staffs at the time. But the reason that I'm so shocked that, you know, men's head coaches haven't hired women as assistants is because now that I've been in the NBA and like the guys in the locker room don't care at all. You know, like I said, they just care yeah. like who you are and you make them better as I think about college age young men, that there are not more male head coaches who look at their staff and say, am I providing my players with everything they need? I think if more of them did that, they'd be going, wait a second, wouldn't a female maybe make us stronger? Um, so my, my thought would be there will probably continue to be more women in the NBA because the NBA is progressive and kind of more open to it. And I, I would imagine that the next thing we'll see are some women assistant coaches in men's basketball. Head coaches is another story. You know, that's a barrier we haven't broken yet um, in the NBA or men's college basketball. So I obviously think we're trending in that direction, but you know, who knows when, when that will happen. Um, It could be, could be really soon. You know, I mean, Becky Hammond could get a head coaching job in the NBA soon. I have no idea. Um, And that would obviously break down a barrier, but I think that it's getting more women on the men's side and people just hiring who they think is best. And then eventually I think you'll see women in head coaching roles in, in men's sports, but I don't, I don't know how far down the road. Yeah. yeah I, that's a, that was a question that I've been really thinking about. Um, and that's why I, I really wanted to have you on the podcast because I wanted to get a perspective of how we are able to progress in order to get these roles. Like for example, if I want to, get a coaching role or whoever that may be listening to the podcast wants to get 
into a role such as your position, how, how are they able to do so? And do you see it pro, um, progressing towards um, a more efficient, a more, um, you know, a collective of it happening? So I, I really appreciate that answer. And what advice would you give for anyone that's listening that wants to be in your position? What do they need to do or consider in order to become um, a part of a franchise? Mm -hmm. Well, what I would say, first of all, and I've given this advice long before I was in the, in the NBA that, you know, to young people want to get into coaching. I feel really strongly in coaching. There's no one correct path, right? It's not yeah, like, definitely. you know, I don't know, like another field where you say, okay, to be a lawyer, you have to go to law school and then you have to get a job as an yeah, associate. It's different. You know, it, there's not one path. Um, so just talking about college for a moment, what I mean by that is, you know, I would always tell people that are young people trying to get in, go to where you're drawn to the people, that the people are going to help you grow as a coach, that the people are going to help mentor you. So that could be being a director of ops at a bigger program and maybe you work your way up to being on the court. It might be going to be an assistant coach at a smaller program, mm -hmm. um, but it's more about whether or not the people are going to cultivate and empower you to do a good job where you are and grow your skills. When it comes to the NBA, um, I would say similar things, right? Like, first of all, you have to, um, you know, know your stuff, right? So if you're yeah. trying to be an entry level position and that's a video position, like you, you have to, you know, be good at the craft. You have to be willing to work at it. You have to add value. Um, but I also think like networking is important. You have to put yourself out there. The, the NBA now has, um, some, some coaching equality initiatives, um, where they're trying to sort of reach out to more young people of diverse backgrounds and get them involved. So if you're a female who wants to be in the NBA, like reach out, like, you know, email people say, do you have any internships? Can I get, can I get involved and work your way up right. for women? I mean, I were, I was in a little bit of a unique position is that being a head coach in women's college basketball. I mean, let's be honest, men's head coaches of a power five program probably wouldn't go to the NBA unless it was for a head coaching job. That's just, yeah. you know, what they would do unless their job was on the line or they were in trouble or something. For me, I knew that um, I would only go to the NBA. I wasn't going to go for like an entry level position because I had, you know, progressed in my career. So the Cavs came with a unique situation where it wasn't the head coaching position, but it was a position of value. It was, um, you know, where I felt like my skills would be utilized. So I would say that women who have been in coaching a while, if you want to get into the NBA, like trust your skills, trust your knowledge and let people know that's what you're interested in. Right. And the opportunities may be there. Continue to network. Don't stay in your one small lane. One thing I did, even though I love women's college basketball still to this day, I love the WNBA. I, I love women's basketball, but even yeah. when I was in women's college basketball, I was going to NBA training camps. I was reaching out to people. I was trying to learn you know, different things to make myself better as a coach for Cal women. And it turned out that that also made me, I think, more ready for an NBA job because I knew NBA mm -hmm. terminology and I knew kind of, uh, it wasn't as much, I'd watched NBA games. So I know that's a lot, but I would say for young people, you know, don't be afraid to say what you want, you know, go after it, make yourself valuable, learn your skills, work really hard and network. And then I would say for people a little further in their career, you know, keep dreaming, anything is possible and think about where you want to go. And then, you know, don't be afraid to pivot like I did at a certain point yeah. in your career and do something different. So what made you pivot? What was the main factor that made you pivot into, into men's sports? I think it was the opportunity that the Cavs came at me with. So this is how I've described it, right? Like I've never had a job and said, okay, well, like I'll stay there three to five years and then I'll be on to the next thing. Not, right. not when I was an assistant, not when I was the head coach at Santa Barbara. I always said, I'm going to go and be, you know, fully invested where I am, but understanding in the coaching profession movement happens at time, but I was never going, okay, you know, I'll stay at Santa Barbara only until I get a bigger job. I was like, no, I'm going to go be the best head coach at Santa Barbara I could be. And then when Cal came calling, I felt like I had to do it. Right. So similarly mm -hmm. in women's college basketball, you know, I, I, I was all invested in, in being at Cal and, 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 and doing that job. If you had asked me like, Hey, Lindsay, if you weren't coaching at Cal, what you, would you be doing? Like, what's right. another dream? Yeah. Of course I had like dreams. And for me, it was not, Oh, I want to be back on the East coast at a different school. Um, it, and it wasn't like being an athletic director. I had no interest in that. Like my sort of other dream job would be like pro sports, right? Like if I wasn't coaching college, yeah, maybe I'd be in the NBA someday, but that's what it was like. It was like a yeah. dream someday. Um, 
And then Becky Hammond got hired with the Spurs and it became a little bit more of like a real thing, like representation matters, right? You see someone, you're like, oh, like it is possible. But still the fact that I was a head coach and kind of doing well at Cal, it wasn't like I wasn't searching for anything. Um, and then people I knew in the NBA started to talk a little bit more about, you know, this is something you could do. But more of my conversations with NBA people were, were about, hey, how did we get young people involved? So I had a player at Cal last year. She was a, a grad transfer with Say Caldwell who was interested in the NBA. We got her an internship with the Warriors. And like, that was awesome, you know, helping yeah, her get that. Time. I, I loved it. Um, that's more where the conversations were. And then the Cavs came to me. And I give, you know, Kobe Altman a lot of credit in that he was thinking kind of differently than anyone else was. He said, look, we're trying to build this staff. We're trying to make it the best staff we can be. We know what you've done. We know you've had coaching experience, you know, we think you can make this jump and be effective for us. And I think at that moment when he presented that, and it was a position in the NBA where I felt like my skills were valued. Of course I have a lot to learn, but it was not entry level, right? It was like, Hey, you, you know, you have head coaching experience. We, we, we think you can help us. I, yeah. then I was like, okay, it's the NBA. It's the <laughs> highest level basketball in the world. Like yeah. it's a dream job. How can I not do this? Even though it was difficult to leave Cal. Yeah, that's amazing. I really love that. That's, I think, I love how you say to really network and branch off. You weren't scared to, you know, get the internship or to ask for um, help within, you know, the community that you're in. Um, and seeing, I think, like how you mentioned before, representation does matter. You know, once Becky got that position, you're able to see like, okay, this is realistic. Once you got that, that job opportunity, it was a, no brainer. You were going to take it. And now you're allowing that, um, the representation to expand. You're allowing other females, other women to look at you in a light of like, okay, Lindsay did this. Now I have no excuse, but to get to where I want to want to go. And so that leads me to my, Oh, no, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm saying, I hope so. Like that was part of, part of it. Like, you know, I really was committed to the impact I could have on the young women I was coaching at Cal. And so yeah. that was like a struggle. Like, how do I leave them? Or how do I leave the next ones I would coach over the next several years? And I think it came down to part of it was, well, maybe I can have an impact on more people. And it, it doesn't mean that every young person is going to want to be a coach in the NBA, but maybe there's a young woman who's like, I want to be a CEO of a company in a male dominated field, or I want to you know, yes. go try to do this. I mean, my, my hope is that the representation is, is not limited to basketball. It's that, you know, women know that sometimes you have to do a scary thing in order to get what you want. And so for me, that was part of, you know, do, making this little bit of a scary leap is, is to, you know, to help show other people like you can do it. No, I really appreciate that. Like how you said, it's in literally every aspect of, someone's life not just within sports but you know within business within career choices uh personal even personal life is sometimes you want to get something but you're too scared to you know "Eh, maybe if i just wait (laughs) but once you wait it's starting to like okay i should have done it x amount of years or x amount of months ago and you might have missed the opportunity that could have really changed your life you know and so um that kind of leads me to my next question is what is your next goal that you have in place for yourself? So I can, I mean, I'm a hundred percent honest when I say I did not take this job with any type of eye on the next thing. And like, that's part of the scary part, right? Cause you did some of the unknown of what, of what else, you know, would be next. Um, It's, it's real. Um, I really feel like the goal with the Cleveland Cavaliers is to help this organization, you know, get back to a place that we want to be, which is being a successful NBA team, being in the playoffs, competing, you know, for, for championships. That's the idea. Um, and to be part of that is really where my focus is. Um, you know, again, if you ask me about the things I'm not like aiming towards every day, but like, okay, like Lindsay, think beyond like mm-hmm. what's out there, you know, do I have a desire to maybe be a head coach again? Maybe like, we'll see. And what does that look like? Is that in the WNBA? Is that in, you know, the NBA, if that becomes a possibility or is it back in college? Like I have no idea, Uh, you know, somewhere out there, you know, is that maybe a distant thing that could happen? Maybe, but I'm not thinking about it every day. I'm not positioning myself. I'm not like, Ooh, you know, if I do X, Y, and Z for these two years, I can get here. I just, that's not the way I live. And I don't think that's the best way to be successful. 
I also think, you know, when you, when you are uh, firmly present where you are, you know, two feet planted all in, that's when you really find like your passions. That's when you're like, okay, I love doing this. I want to do it forever. Or when you're like, I love doing this, but I also like this, you know, whether it's speaking to groups or, you know, maybe, maybe it ends up where, you know, I, I, I get interested in the front office stuff and want to be a GM. I don't, I don't know. Um, so right now I'm loving what I'm doing and I am confident that I'll do it as long as they'll have me or until something comes along that becomes clear. It's the next thing for me, but I, I I don't expect that, you know, that's not what I'm aiming towards, if that makes sense. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I love the fact that you're, you're being honest, you're being authentic. Like how you say, you don't, (laughs) you're not sure what the next plan is for you, but you know, it's going to continue to progress. And when, when you get to that point, that's when you'll be like, Oh, okay, I'm gonna do this, or I'm gonna do that. You don't always have to know what you're doing before you take, you know, an opportunity. Sure. And I will tell you this, what I know for sure is that what I'm doing right now is enriching me as a basketball coach, yes, as a human yes. being, life experiences. Like I'm just, I'm more well-rounded already having coached, you know, Kevin Love and Kevin Porter Jr. In addition to, you know, the women who made an impact on me from Cal, like it's yeah. just, yeah. it's really cool to kind of have these experiences and, and, and hopefully continue to have them for a long time. No, most definitely. And I hope, I hope it is, you know, and I know it will. I know it for sure will, especially for you. And um, this is kind of like the last question is probably the most, you know, sentimental, um, you know, most impactful, but uh, in regards to Kobe Bryant, right? Um, What has his legacy and, you know, he's really trying, he really tried to promote the women's game, which is the most, you know, gracious thing that uh, a man or a, a, a person with that status, you know, could do within women's sports in general. He always promoted women in sports so how has he affected um you as a person um within coaching and etc yeah it's interesting so i met kobe bryant one time uh it was at a coaching clinic in southern california that i that i attended uh and so you know he swung by he talked about the triangle offense he talked for a while um and then, you know, we all had a chance to meet him after and I, and I was kind of like waiting my turn. And, and then I, you know, I said, Hey, Kobe, thanks for coming. You know, I'm Lindsay Gottlieb, coach of Calvin. Like he kind of cut me off. He said, I know who you are. I follow you on oh, Twitter. Man. And of course I was like, Oh my gosh, this is Kobe Bryant. But, but here's the thing. I've talked to 25 people who have their Kobe moment. Right. And, yeah. and I think one thing that's really neat is that he was this larger than life figure, this, you know, top, whatever, five, five basketball player of all time. And I'm not the only person that he made feel important in that moment, right? I think other people felt the same way. And uh, I think in particular, he did that a lot for women's basketball players and coaches. He made people involved in women's basketball feel seen. So obviously, you know, the, the, the tragedy of his, of his death this year is I think something that no one will forget, kind of those where were you moments. For me, it was particularly significant because I was on an NBA plane, right? Like we were on the team plane yeah. and – you know, you're around people that, that, you know, one of our coaching staff members coached him and, you know, Larry Nance Jr. played with him in LA and like the direct impact that people had. But for me, I think my, the unique impact on me was how he made it really cool to be a girl dad, um, how he made it cool to care about women's basketball at the little kid level and at the WNBA level. And I do think going forward, the legacy will be that other, first of all, the NBA players like the WNBA already, like they know good basketball, but, but I think they will feel maybe a little more secure to be like, no, this is worth investing in. This is worth investing my time, my, my energy, you know, especially ones Mm -hmm. with daughters. So uh, for me, that's where kind of seeing the impact of an NBA icon on, on the women's basketball world and how he made everyone feel legitimate um is is something that 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 legacy will continue on right i definitely have um you know heard stories about the impact that he's made uh, especially like the more personal stories like how you mentioned before how you made everyone feel important and i think that's that's a huge thing especially in the time that we're in that we need to start making people feel like very personal and like they matter every single person no matter who they are and and that's what made him, you know, not only the GOAT on the basketball uh, side of things, but also within, you know, the personal and business. Because everybody, not just sports fans, are able to connect with the person. 
such as him. So I think that's Absolutely. huge. I think that's yeah, huge. For sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, I definitely appreciate you for being my first guest <laughs> on yeah. the podcast. The whole conversation from beginning to end was, you know, especially for me, just learning and, um, and listening. It was very insightful. And I believe that anyone that listens to this is going to really appreciate all the feedback and the information that you were able to provide. So I wanted to thank you again for being on our podcast. Is there anything else that you would like to say before we, before we sign off? No, just I'm excited to see where you take Swish Cultures and your podcast. Um, and just really, really neat to see how successful uh, you're being post Cal athletic career. So I'll always be a big fan. <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate you. Um, go Bears. Go Bears. <laughs> <laughs>